I don't want a black woman in my family. When I heard these words, I had an overwhelming sense of anxiety, confusion, and fear. At some point, I even had to laugh at the ridiculousness of it all. Because you see, these harsh words, they came from my mommy. And when she had said that, I realized that she had never seen me and will never see me for me. It also made me realize on what I thought about myself and how I saw myself. And that I realized that I needed to embark on a very tough but important journey of reclaiming me. It was the year 2008. My white foster sister called me to tell me that our mommy, the woman that had raised us all, had tried to end her life with sleeping tablets. And when she told me, all I wanted to do was reach out and find out why, why, and hopefully get an apology. But instead, all she could say was that I don't want a black woman in my family. How did we get here? Let's take it to the back, to the, to the beginning. In 1974, I was born to the Buffer King Nation in a village called Pugeng to Pat and Jacobeth Mutene. It was the midst of apartheid, and as we know, the racist system had stripped black people and non-white people of their identity, dignity, respect, and so much more. At the time, my father worked for BP Garage in Johannesburg as a petrol attendant. My mother was a, was a domestic worker working for a white Jewish family in Johannesburg. She had been working for the family for many, many years and was seen as a member of the family in a master and servant type of way. After I was born, I returned back to Johannesburg with my mum, and the plan was for me to only remain there for three months and then be raised by my maternal grandmother back in Pogeng alongside my older sister, who's 14 years my senior. When my, when my mother relays the story, she said that when I came into the house, her employees fell in love with me. I was almost like a toy to the family. And the events that happened until the final decision was made are still a bit blurred, but if the final decision of me remaining in, De in Johannesburg um, was decided upon. I was going to be educated to the private Catholic school system as opposed to the Bantu education system that I would have received if I was back in Pogeng. This wonderful gesture that was made by my foster family was a brilliant and beautiful gesture because it was an education and a lifestyle that my biological parents would never have been able to afford. But it did come with sacrifices. Sacrifices for my foster family because they had to go up against the system, the racist system, the family society for what they were doing for a black child. The sacrifices for my biological side of the family because they had to w watch and see their own child be raised under another race, creed, religion, culture, and lifestyle. I had the best of everything. Clothes, trips on holiday to Plettenberg Bay, to Cape Town. Anything my heart desired, I was given on a materialistic level. So you're probably wondering, if this brat had it all, then why is she complaining? Well, yeah, I did have it all. But inside, I was holding on to a pain that was filled with confusion, which led to a major identity crisis, which I could never talk about or bring to the forefront because I was so worried it was going to disrupt what was happening in my life. I was never taught about my culture, about black pride, my language, my religion. In fact, I saw it as a deformity. I was one of those black children that used to go home at night and pray to God, please can I wake up as a little white girl so I can have blonde hair, wear my hair in a bobble and possibly a banana clip just so I could feel normal. 
if we were out, which happened many times, whether it was out or whether it was in the family or at school, racist comments were the norm. And if it got to a situation where somebody was slightly uncomfortable, the excuse was always, oh no, but Rose, you know, you're different, hey? And I allowed that. I allowed this throughout from my childhood all the way through to my adulthood until I realized just how toxic it was. There were so many other elements of toxicity that, lived, that, 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 that I lived with, especially growing up as a small child. For instance, if I was naughty, I was reprimanded with, if you do that again, we're going to send you to Poking. So my place of home became my place of fear. All of this I carried through for many, many years. Even in my 20s, I tried to numb the pain with alcohol and recreational drugs until I said enough is enough. Which then led to the years leading up to that day when my mommy wanted to take those sleeping tablets. You're probably wondering what was the reason for her wanting to take her life. Well, her son had announced that he had fallen in love and wanted to marry a beautiful black woman. And my mommy wasn't going to have anything of that. The same woman who put herself on the line during the apartheid years did not want any more blackness in her family. And it was at that point in my life I realized the difference between conditional and unconditional love. I, take, I call that phase of the conditional love as, as, as shattering the glass mold, because from beginning, they put over a white washed glass mold over me and fed to me what I should believe, how I should talk, how I should see myself, how I should see other black people, and I needed to smash that. And in the process of smashing that and moving it away, I needed to create my own throne, because remember, we are kings and queens. And in that process, I needed to focus on the unconditional love that my biological parents and family always gave me, but I didn't realize. And with that came with a reflection of having to know who they are. Although they were still alive when I used to visit them at home and, and holidays and so forth, I'd never ever lived under their roof and under their rules. And when it's time to make a shift in your life, God will let you know. Mine came through a sign where I had a sharp pain on the left side of my body as I was driving on the highway. And the words that came through my head was, go home. And so I packed up my privileged lifestyle, got into my little car, and I drove to Pugeng, my place of fear. And I needed to work on my relationship with my parents. I started with my father, whom I called Papa, because we didn't really have a relationship when I was very, very young. And the more I interacted with him, the more I realized there were so many similarities that we had between the two of us from drinking our, waking up at five in the morning, drinking our black coffee, no sugar, no milk, until one day he broke out into beautiful song in this deep baritone voice, and I realized that is where I get my creative energy and spirit from. There was even one, air, one day when I accompanied him to a Lakotla meeting, which is a gathering of the elders in the village, and he was asked to stand, and the whole community commended him and applauded him, because it was announced that his youngest child was now back in the community living and looking after her parents. And I remember looking up to him and thinking, now that is the black pride that I, that I didn't understand as he stood there with this glint in his eyes wearing his checkered jacket, one that was reserved for only special occasions. My conversations with Mama weren't that easy because I wanted to ask so many questions about the decisions that were made about me staying and living in Emerentia. And the more I asked those questions, the more I realized I was causing a lot of angst and pain in her. And I made the decision never to do that again because growing up, I was that brat. I never acknowledged my mother for who she was. For instance, in the household of her employees, her name was Bumba, which was, which was a nickname for Fatty Bum Bum. That was the name I called my mother. There was even a time when I was too small to wipe myself, and I remember crying out, Mommy, please come wipe my bum. And Mama came in, and I dismissed her and told her to get out. I said, you're not my mother. I want my real mother. And my foster mother came in and completed the job. And this was the norm. This is how we grew. And so during my process of, of trying to figure out who I am, reclaiming my Africanness, 
and a lot of people asking questions, well, how do you reclaim your Africanness? How do you reclaim your blackness? Well, if it wasn't there from the beginning, that is why it's essential to try and get it back. So where am I now? Where am I with my Africanness? To tell you the truth, I'm not quite sure. But I'm definitely not that girl who started the journey over a decade and a half ago. I remember walking outside um, during this time when I was in Pogeng and I picked up some soil. And I saw as the soil was, was falling between the finger of my fingers. And I realized that that was the loss and, and the, the, the culture and tradition that's all gone. And I'll never be able to get that back. But what is in the palm of my hand is what I will nurture forever and what, how I will reclaim myself. I had to start looking at myself, how I saw myself, my skin, how I began to love my skin, love my body, my hair. The weave that I carried for 12 years no longer served its purpose. Stepping into situations where I could step up as a black woman and claim my space. Language. <clears throat> That's a difficult one. Because on my journey and understanding the power and importance of African language, how it's connected to everything. It's not just a word, it's connected to everything, to the soil, all the way back to our ancestors. That's why when they came in and they colonized us, they had to break our language because it's connected to our tradition and culture. So yeah, Gabua, Bikinyan. Yeah, and they'll laugh and it's okay because I no longer am doing it to validate the next person. And yes, I may sound like a white person when I do it, but it's okay, I'm sounding like Rosie. Forgiveness. Whew. The toughest one. It's so difficult to forgive and to forgive oneself. But it's essential for your healing. And once again, I got another, another sign from God. This time it came in the form of a lump in my left breast. And I went to my doctor, and because it was growing extensively and they couldn't do a bi biopsy, they opted for surgery, where they removed the lump and a certain part of my breast. And as I was going through the healing process, I, and, and we got our tests back, and thank God it wasn't cancer. But I spoke to another medical practitioner, and she explained to me was that the reason why it happened into my, le my left breast was because it's close to my heart, which is a connection to my mother and my matronial side. And if I hadn't healed both sides and created forgiveness, lumps would manifest all over my body. And so I started that process, create, connecting that bond, because remember, the bond was gone from me and mommy in the beginning. So creating that connection and healing. And yo, we're in a beautiful place where we are now. The connection and the forgiveness from my foster mother wasn't as easy because it's difficult to get forgiveness from somebody who doesn't believe or think that they should give forgiveness. And so mourning somebody when they're still alive is so, so difficult, but it's essential for healing. And I went through that process. This was in 2015. This year I had to relive the process when I found out that she had actually physically died. And I'd found out by a post on Facebook and although I knew the family would never have included me in any of the funeral arrangements, just like they excluded me when my foster father passed away out of a very, very important family ritual that, that, that took place at the grave. And I was okay with that because I'm in a new space. But it's also a new space of reclaiming how to mourn, how to deal, how to heal. And I saw that with, with certain friends on how they didn't um, recognize or give me the respect of a mourning child and in the mourning process. And that's okay. Because once again, it's not about their validation. It's about me finding me in the space. So as I elevate and I grow to the next level where I will find my challenges, ask so many questions, but I will continue to do it in my space, my time myself. Thank you.